All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Imran Siddiqui. I'm the Director of Communications for the Representation Project, and I'm so excited that you're here to join us today for this Google Hangout titled uh, Beyond the Binary, um, Artists Challenging Toxic Masculinity. Today's conversation is actually going to be moderated by Juliana, who's from the International Museum of Women, and uh, they're one of our partners, and we've been working We've worked together on um, curating, uh, recently curating an exhibition with the International Museum of Women on masculinity. And um, so, yeah, Juliana, you can take it away and uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Imran. Yeah. So uh, just to give a little bit more context on the inspiration behind this hangout, um, like Imran said, we've worked, the International Museum of Women has worked a lot with the Representation Project. Um, and museums specifically, the work that we do is involved with um, sort of creatively uh, representing women's voices and creating a platform for women to share uh, their thoughts about, you know, promoting gender equality. And a really big part of that is men's role within it, right? There's no way for us to to move towards gender equality without breaking down gender norms. So uh, like Imran said, Jennifer Siebel Newsom recently curated a selection of um, from IMAO's rich archives of uh, work specifically looking at masculinity and since the representation project has a film coming up that we're so excited to learn more about um, that will focus on toxic masculinity within media we thought what better chance to talk a little bit about how we can use media and art and you know all sorts of mediums to creatively break down some of these gender norms um, so Next up, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves, since I, I believe in um, everyone being able to represent themselves however they choose to do. Uh, like Imran said, I'm the Digital Communications and Media Manager at the International Museum of Women. Alexa, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexa Hassink. I'm representing Promundo. I'm currently in from Washington, D.C., um, our office there, but we also have our founding offices in Brazil and we have a third office in Portugal. So um, our organization conducts research, programming, and advocacy all about engaging men and boys to promote gender equality and to prevent violence against women. So we use some different kind of media and art forms to help advance our mission, which I'm sure we'll talk more about as we go, but great to be here. Thanks. Danny, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks. My name is Danny Fishman. Um, I'm a member of the Representation Project team, and I am one of the producers on our newest documentary film that is in the end of its production phase called The Mask You Live In, which addresses um, sort of the hyper-masculine narrative that we feed our boys and men in America. And I'm happy to be here. Good. John, you're last. Hi, my name is John Edmonds. I'm a photographer and visual artist based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, most of my work deals with representation of uh, masculine identity, gender, and sexuality. Great. And Imran, I believe you've already introduced yourself unless you want to add anything. Uh, no, I'm just excited to be here and to talk about this particular topic. It's um, very, very interesting to me. So, yeah, go ahead. Great. Well then, Imran, my first question is actually for you. I was wondering if you could start us off, um, you know, when promoting this event, we were using a lot of terms that maybe not everyone knows what we're talking about. So I was wondering, could you break down for us what is a gender binary, and what do we mean when we say gender norms, breaking down gender norms, um, and what, what do you think sort of traditional masculinity, what does that represent to you, and what, what are we going to be talking about today? Yeah, sure. You know, um you know, broadly, the, when we say gender binary, we were, we're really talking about the social structure of the system that tries to put people into two distinct um, categories of masculine and, and feminine and, um, and limits us in that way to those two categories. And then the gender norms are those things which come out of that system or have come out of that system over time, which kind of um, signify or identify someone as you know, masculine or, or feminine, uh, stereotypically. And um, so it, in that vein, when we say traditional masculinity, we're really thinking about what are the norms um, that have come to be in our society um, that identify someone as masculine. And um, if anyone has seen our trailer for, for The Mask You Live In, you know, we, 
we look, we look at a lot of the language that people use, you know, things like be a man or um, phrases like man up, um, but also we, where we look at, you know, boys are, and men are traditionally valued for being aggressive, for being dominant, um, rather than being compassionate or, um, you know, uh, cooperative. And so uh, particularly, you know, when I think about traditional masculinity, I think about, um, you know, keeping your emotions inside and being really strong and tough um, physically and having the ability to kind of dominate others. And so uh, that's what I'm hoping we can talk about and we can break down today and show how art um, can serve that purpose. Absolutely. That's a, I think that's a great definition. Thanks, Imran. Uh, so my next question is for you, John. Um, when I took a look at some of your art, I remember just immediately feeling this sense of how vulnerable a lot of your subjects were, which I thought was so incredible and really different than what the way I'm used to seeing men of color being represented. Um, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about what were your thoughts behind that, you know, how much of that was purposeful. Was that difficult to get your subjects to that place? Sure. Um, with a lot of the work that I have been doing recently, um, specifically the, the work that was featured on the New York Times, Lynn's blog, um, the Tethered series, um, I'm going out into the community in which I live in, which is a predominantly black um, and African-American community, um, community with men who do present themselves in a very hyper-masculine, aggressive uh, disposition um, manner. and. Um, I'm going out into the community and interacting with people and photographing them and um, talking to them about their own personal experiences um, with um, within the community that they live in. Um, I'm specifically uh, addressing my own relationship to other men in my own community as well. Um, and I think that for me as an African-American male to photograph other African-American men and portray them with um, compassion and through vulnerability and f to show them in um, sort of vulnerable, sensitive um, disposition is a very personal yet very political sort of conversation to have uh, with within my work and um, in all my work. I'm interested in the the relationship between you know the the personal intent with the sort of political discourse that comes to it within the public. Um, and yes, it was very, it, you know, it, it can be very difficult also sometimes when, you know, you're walking around with this, this big camera and, you know, you want to photograph people because, um, not because you're shooting a story or you're working with um, a, a specific, you know, uh, um, institution, but because you're doing it uh, as a visual artist and you're doing it because it's something that you're, you just feel the need and the drive to do. So yes, it is very difficult, you know, not being represented by, you know, a specific gallery or uh, institution in doing this work, but um, something I've always just feel very driven to do and I feel very connected with, um, so. That's so interesting. You know, I actually kind of had a follow-up question for you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is it like sort of working within those communities, do you, as, as a photographer and an artist, do you sometimes feel like uh, you have to position yourself as an outsider in order to get that, or do you feel like your role as a black man yourself makes that easier? I definitely think that, um, you know, you know, as stated previously, many of the men I'm photographing are, you know, African-American, and I definitely think that me being an African American male just gives me so much access to, um, to that because they feel a sort of uh, or a sense of camaraderie with me. So um, you know, I definitely think that that gives me an advantage. It gives me an upper hand, um, and and I think that that in itself, um, uh, yeah, it gives me an upper hand, and it, it, it makes me feel as though I'm doing something that I have a permission to do. Um, you know, just just being immersed in the community that I'm working with. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that, mm -hmm. Danny. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the mask you live in. Um, can you talk a little? I know that you've done a lot of research behind the film, and you've been really instrumental in in its production. Can you talk a little bit about 
sort of the choices that you made about choosing subjects who work within what we understand as traditional masculinity and those who exist outside of it. Um, and while you start talking, I'm going to turn on the light in my room because it turned off, but I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, it has been quite a journey um, producing this film and doing all of the research that was entailed to um, to sort of explore all the different definitions of masculinity, whether they align with what we see as traditional, mainstream, and sometimes a harmful masculine narrative, and then also representations of masculinity masculinity that don't fit into you know what we see every day in mainstream media or even in sort of mainstream cultural um, assessments of masculinity so I think what we've tried to do with the film is uncover um, just like we're doing in this conversation just sort of like explore and uncover where do these messages come from and how are they experienced by different men across cultures and across demographics in our culture and in American society and then what we found is that there's a real combination of experiences partially that really identify with these hyper-masculine and sometimes unhealthy norms. And then there's also a huge array of experiences that we've uncovered in the film that don't necessarily align with these um, sort of hyper-masculine and more mainstream views of masculinity. And so it's been very interesting to see that even within each individual's experience, they have experiences that really align with hyper-masculine unhealthy norms, and then they have experiences, usually more private ones, that don't necessarily um, align with, with that hyper-masculine narrative. So we've seen a large variation, and I think that that's all that the representation project is about, is that wide array of experiences. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious, while sort of interviewing different people, did you come across anyone who, because, you know, I know that as a woman, you know, we also face gender norms and we, we're also dealing with them on the daily and there's there's times when I feel like I really fit into what I'm expected to be as a woman and there's times there's parts of me that really don't and I can imagine that there might be a lot of men out there who sort of have aspects of them that are really traditionally masculine and aspects that aren't. Did you meet anyone that had a really interesting sort of way of straddling that that line that we cross all the time? Definitely. There was, I mean, there are countless stories that we've come across either in the research or talking to academics or in the actual individuals and groups that we've filmed where there's a really interesting sort of struggle and straddle happening between these different definitions of masculinity. So some examples of that are the experience of a single father, the experience of men who are stay-at-home fathers, which we saw in the curation um, that Jennifer did for International Museum of Women. So that's a really interesting experience. And so far as to going into men who are practicing mindfulness and meditation in the prison population or um, people who are working on transformational coaching and working on positive violence prevention initiatives. So all of these men who are sort of doing work or in on themselves in their own lives or as providers um, who are sort of stepping outside of that hypermasculine box have definitely during the filming process talked about how it's difficult for them to straddle the line sometimes and sort of be an advocate for a mission or a cause or a value system that they think is really important to them, but also sort of pushing up against um, hyper-masculine norms and mandates that our culture puts on them. So there's been countless um, really interesting stories and we're really excited to finally soon show them to the world. <laughs> Wow, I'm, I'm really excited to see the film, I can't tell you. Um, I've been waiting for it, so I hope it comes out soon. Um, Alexa, I would love to hear from you a little bit about, you know, kind of give us an international perspective. Obviously, that's a huge task, and there's no way you could possibly represent, you know, even a, a tenth of, um, you know, the rest of the world. But I know that Promundo works really a lot in Brazil, and. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that they've had to that are sort of give creative um, platforms to men, particularly living in favelas, living in you know more poor neighborhoods of um, of Brazil, to represent themselves in different ways than the media sometimes does. 
Sure. So, yes, as you said, the global perspective, obviously, I'll try. I won't claim to hit it all. But um, Promundo was founded in Brazil, so a lot of our work is focused in Latin America, and we also have a lot of work in East Africa and other regions as well. So we have experience working on these issues and involving men and boys in these initiatives for gender equality kind of across different settings. So um, one, one of the main ways that we use media and imagery to really challenge gender norms is we see it as a way to show how we want men to behave and how we want women to behave. So we're approaching everything from the perspective of this is normal behavior to care for your child and have a respectful relationship with your wife. So instead of a campaign that might show violence or show the negative um, behaviors that are taking place, we choose to show the positive behaviors. Um, and that actually is something that came out of our research where um, a survey that we conducted in about 10 countries that kind of questions what men are thinking and doing when it comes to gender equality. And one of the things that we found is, you know, there's a really strong association um, between men seeing violence when they're growing up and men using violence later on. But the mm -hmm. positive spin to that is there's also an association between men seeing their fathers um, being caring, participating in the household, and then replicating those behaviors. So we feel that by showing these positive, caring images of men, we're really helping to put that image out there and hoping that um, men will kind of see these behaviors and realize it's it's the norm. This is normal behavior for men and normal behavior for humans. Um, so a couple of ways we've used those initiatives. Um, one program they had in Brazil, um, they actually did a multimedia campaign that was a radio soap opera. Uh, so what they did was they told the story of a young boy and a young girl um, from a women's empowerment and feminist perspective. So they had these two in kind of a you know dramatic soap opera fashion go through these different phases of relationship. They dealt with sexual experiences, condom use, unplanned pregnancies, having relationships, but then they dealt with these issues and talked through them together. So setting a really great example of how you can move through these different different kind of complications that come up in life but with a collaborative way instead of maybe a traditional you know masculine domineering way or however those um, those norms kind of play out in the context so what was cool about that is that the show was played on the radio but also you know in community centers beauty salons um, and community gathering places so it's a really great way to get out the messaging in kind of a non-traditional way so you're not just giving a lecture you're modeling this behavior in a really entertaining fashion so that's one great example um, we have some more too, but I don't want to take up too much time. So, I mean, I would worry about taking too much time. It's really a fascinating <laughs> topic, but um, that's a really interesting example. Another question that I had for you: um, I know, you know, I know that Promundo does a lot of work in uh, the favelas of Brazil. And for those who don't know, a favela is um, basically what we would understand to be a ghetto. Um, that and those in Brazil are known to be particularly mm -hmm. violent and have a lot of drug trade um, going in them. I was curious, curious how much sort of Promundo, how much feedback Promundo has gotten about the, the stereotypes that these young men face. And I think that this is something that maybe men in the U.S. can deal with also, but, you know, mm -hmm. I know many Brazilians who, who are really upset about the stereotypes that all Brazilians are violent and that all Brazilians, you know, deal in drugs. Mm -hmm. How, wh what have you heard, you know, as an organization from the people you're working with? Sure, sure. And actually, so um, one man, Marcio, um, that we work with often, his he was actually profiled on the website. So anyone can follow up there to see his story. He's really great, really amazing. Um, and we also have a video of his story as well. Um, but one, one of the struggles that I think comes across context is, is men you know, being asked to live up to a certain set of behaviors and really being presented with this pathway to success that might be in conflict yeah, with what they care about you know, on a human level, on a personal level. So um, there might be one way to be violent, to gain respect, to get involved in activities that are maybe lucrative but don't feel right. And um, and then, you know, replicating behaviors if they were in households where they were raised with violence. And I think that there is, there is a standard, but that men really want to change. And so what we see in kind of our community-based programming in Brazil is that when we bring men in to talk to one another about the challenges they're facing and to do some kind of group activities and discussions in a safe place, um, that wall breaks down pretty quickly. Um, it's not it's not always easy. It takes a lot of work, but um, I think it's very clear that that's 
these behaviors that are being associated and stereotyped and that some men feel that they have to subscribe to really really aren't what they're feeling at their cores and how they want to be behaving. And so I think that um, when put in a space where they can really express that and talk to one another um, and share what they care about and their struggles, um, a lot of real emotion comes out and a lot of real feeling and sensitivity and um, caring comes out. Great. Thanks. So my next question is for everyone. Um, I think it's a really interesting sort of exercise, honestly, for me, I've done it before. I'd love to know if everyone could quickly kind of talk a little bit about, do you remember the first time that you were policed into your gender? And by that I mean, do you remember the first time that someone told you, you know, based on how, what they perceive to be your gender, that you need to act like a lady or act like a man, um, and sort of what that ended up shaping for you? You can take a second, you have to think about it. I have uh, I have kind of a, a funny example that comes to mind right away, so I'll go ahead and <laughs> kick yeah. it off. Um, it's actually something that my grandmother recounted to me, so I didn't even remember this happening. But um, it was when I was younger, and I have two older brothers, and they were playing up in the treehouse, and so and they were playing. They were being army soldiers, um, and I came along and asked if I could play, and so and I. And they told me, they're like, yeah, you can play, you can be the nurse. And my grandma said, even I think I was four years old, she was like, if I'm going to play, I'm going to be the doctor. Or <laughs> <That's great. laughs> make that known. So I think I would credit that to uh, my mother. But I, I thought that story was really funny. That's good. Yeah, you knew from a young age. <laughs> you know, I, I can chime in on my, my earliest memory. Um, this probably happened. It probably happened before this. But the thing that's coming to mind now is like I remember uh, when I was around eight years old. I, I was raised um, Muslim, and in my and I, ha I used to go to uh, Sunday school. And I remember sitting with my sister in, in uh, Sunday school, and we were talking about uh, prophets in the religion and. Uh, I remember asking the teacher why none of the prophets were uh, women, and uh, mainly because uh, we, me and my sister and myself also, we used to, this is weird, but we used to play like we were prophets and stuff. I don't know, it's weird. But, uh, but you know, I asked the teacher why there were no women who were prophets, and then the teacher, um, you know, just said, oh, no reason, there's just none. And uh, But I remember going at, after um, after that class, going back to my sister and then talking about, you know, we were little kids, so I was remember thinking, oh, I could be a prophet, but you couldn't be, you know. And that was really one of the first times I remember being aware of a difference in possibility uh, for me versus my sister. So um, I don't know if it's really being police. It was more like an exciting thing for me at the time. But years later, thinking back on it, uh, that was probably the first moment where I really felt like I'm different than my sister. Um, just by virtue of my gender. Yeah, well that makes sense. You know, policing isn't always, you know, violent or sort of really explicit language. We learn, we learn through following others, so that's an example, I think. Well, I, I guess... Oh, go ahead, sweetie. John, follow you. <laughs> um, well, like Alexa, um, I grew up uh, with... I grew up with my mom and I had three older sisters um, and it's funny because um, when the question was first proposed, I was thinking to myself, I, I gave myself a moment to like really look and reflect and think, uh, if I really could remember a specific moment. Um, and for me, you know, growing up with three older sisters, um, single family home, and also growing up in a predominantly, you know, African American community, it's like, um, it's, it's a learned behavior how a male should act is, you know, is learned behavior, um, you know, not just at school or in the public, but it's also something that is very, very um, predominant at home. And, um, you know, for me, I can't remember a specific moment, but uh, I think that it, it actually, for me, is very interesting seeing that there is no real um, distinction of time when it comes as an actualization of, like, you should act like this as a male or female because it's just... Um, 
for many people, they think it's a part of your genetic buildup or it's a part of your genetic being when it, when it isn't. And it's such learned behavior. And it's, it's something that begins from a very, very young age. Um, uh, since I did grow up around so many females, I was always a bit more sensitive or a bit more feminine than other males. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just really funny to think about also because when I'm dealing with you know, men in the public, the ones that I always gravitate towards are men who are hyper-masculine and um, sort of like removing that veil of hyper-masculinity because there is so much more emotional, you know, subtlety there, so. Yeah, definitely. Um. For me, I know the question was sort of about an early memory or experience, but I just have noticed recently in my adult life, I've had these very interesting sort of gendered experiences, and I'm sure that as the other women on the panel probably are, I'm a pretty like fiercely independent and passionate young woman, um, and I have noticed a, a challenge coming my way as I have um, sort of moved into my later 20s and started to make choices about my independence and my lifestyle, whether it be living by myself in a city that none of my family members live in or doing reentry counseling and work in the prison population and constantly time and time again I'm being challenged by people even if it's in a very loving um, way, but that because of my gender there's somehow an implied weakness and that I shouldn't be um, you know, operating or behaving in such an independent fashion or that I shouldn't be, you know, working in particular communities or um, around particular types of work. And that's been very challenging um, for me as an adult woman to, to feel like um, there isn't an innate, like, confidence in the people around me that as a woman I can still handle myself um, and and handle myself in my choices and in my responsibilities as an adult. So I have noticed it more as a grown up than I ha than I did as a child, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. It's almost as if women are kind of expected to be somewhat childlike even to their adult life, whereas men are expected to turn into adults much younger, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that is a perfect segue into, um, I think those are really all great examples and it gives our audience a sense of what it is that we're talking about on the daily, you know what I mean? Uh, gender norms are something that we all come up against all the time. It just, it may not feel like it, but it really is kind of everywhere. So, you know, since we have such a great panel of creative people, I'd love to know what you all think is, what's particularly useful about art? Um, in pushing against these gender norms. At, um, at the International Museum of Women, we use the word artivism a lot, which is, you know, a combination between the word art and activism. So what kind of creative activism do you all engage in? Um, I, I can take a stab at that. You know, at, at the Representation Project, we're, we were kind of founded on this idea that um, media media can be used to change media. You know, our first film was Misrepresentation, and uh, that film, uh, you know, kind of looked at how women and girls were represented in the media and how that impacted their real lives. But we, it was an independent movie, and, um, you know, by, I think it's so powerful when we use uh, the medium through which we're being, like, sent all these messages and all these limiting ideas of gender. When we use that very medium, to challenge it and to expand um, the cultural conversation, then I think that that's just so powerful. We've seen it happen, you know, since 2011. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of people have joined this movement, and the coolest thing is that you see, um, especially young people, really resonating with this idea that they have the ability to create the narrative themselves. So, you know, they're watching TV and they're constantly being told, you know, this is how you you can act, you should act as a girl or decide you should act as a boy, but with um, modern technology it's so easy for us to create our own stories that subvert those ideas. And then on top of that with social media, um, we can actually influence what's happening in, in the mainstream. You know, if we get enough people to pay attention to our stories, if we get enough support and we work together, you know, whether it's using hashtags or using, you know, different social media campaigns, we've seen over and over that you know, particularly in our instance, you know, we've seen women and women of color create 
stories which actually become the mainstream narrative. And then so media literally has changed, you know, because now they have to pay attention to us and they have to pay attention to our stories. So I, I think that's what's one element of what's so powerful about art and media which challenges uh, gender norms, especially today, is that it has the power to literally change um, how our experience with the media. Yeah, I love that example. You already know that, but um, I'm going to turn my light back on, but who wants to go next? Um, I can continue talking a little bit about our work and specifically about documentary film as an art form. Um, and I think that photography definitely applies too because I think those mediums, you're taking the work that you're doing and you're using it to provide a platform and illuminate the experiences of others. Um, and so that has been one of the most amazing parts of being a part of the documentary film process for The Mask You Live In is that through this art form, you can really illuminate all of these different experiences of different people. And when you're talking about media, it's so different than what you see in mainstream media. You see these very siloed narratives about particular populations of people in mainstream media. And I think through documentary film, and especially films like Misrepresentation and like The Mask You Live In, it's an opportunity to expose popular culture and mainstream audiences to these experiences and these groups of people that they may have never seen before. Um, and coming from a background of direct service and education and doing a lot of work in schools, I remember always feeling so inspired by the stories that I was surrounded by and thinking to myself, I wish that I could show this to everyone I know. Um, and only through documentary film have I realized that there really is an art form in which you can illuminate these on the ground stories so that you know mainstream audiences can see them. So I think it's a really important art form. Definitely, I agree. Sure, I can add my piece as well. Um, I think those points were all really great. Um, for, and I think the point that, you know, as much as media can have a negative impact, when you're controlling and creating media, you have the responsibility and the opportunity to create messages that are positive and portraying um, and the positive messaging that you want to see. Um, so for us, I think it's been, it's been powerful in kind of two ways. So we have the final media products that we have, and then the processes themselves that are actually activism and art activism. So in the final products, we have things, um, I mentioned the radio soap opera, but we have um, theater and skits that we use. For example, um, in the fall, we're putting on an event. Um, as In part of our post-conflict work, we work with men who have experienced a lot of trauma and um, have kind of continued to use violence after the conflict ends. And so one of our programs, um, the Living Peace Groups, actually works with the men to kind of in a group therapy setting to work through these trauma and lead towards healing. So as part of an event to talk about these programming and these issues, we have, um, we're incorporating with a play where a veteran comes and talks about how he's healed um, from his trauma that he experienced in war through using Shakespeare. And so he has a one-man show. So um, they're kind of products where we're using uh, different kind of mediums to get our messages across. Um, in addition to the radio soap opera, we have some films um, for our Men Care Fatherhood campaign with these beautifully filmed stories of uh, men and each feature one man that's kind of faced a particular challenge, whether it's overcoming um, bar violence, which was in Marcio's story, which is featured on um, the museum site, as well as um, or overcoming sexual violence, or just tr overcoming being the um, primary caretaker for your children in a community that you know has some mixed feelings about it. So um, in that sense, we're putting out these stories of men and showing the challenges of kind of bucking up against these expectations of masculinity, but also the joys that come with them. So we have all these ways of getting our, our messaging out and kind of um, to the world and to our communities in positive ways through personal stories. Um, and then in a lot of our programming, uh, the process of creating the media in itself is a type of activism. So um, in Brazil, we produced a book that was um, that used children to write a story for adults. So children um, participated in a group activity to write this story to tell adults the messages that they want to hear. And some of that's about violence as well and corporal punishment. Um, in another um, setting, also in Brazil, uh, we had a campaign that was called Shameless, uh, and it was about sexual and reproductive health, and it was based on the question, 
why why would you be ashamed basically about talking about condom negotiation, um, which often becomes a problem, and that problem is based a lot in these gender norms that are very rigid. So high school kids actually created the campaign for a high school audience. So sometimes in creating the media and creating the um, product, you can use the voices of those that you want to reach to create the product to find the final product and in the process kind of empower them to think more deeply about these topics and become kind of activists themselves. So. Yeah, I love those stories. They're great. Um, I, I wanted to just, I mean, I don't know if um, Giuliani, you can see this. We, there's some questions from the, the audience and one person asked a pretty interesting question relevant to what we were just saying about Artivism, and they asked, um, "How do we make artivism accessible to all communities? What are the barriers to accessibility?" And I thought that I thought that was an interesting question, you know, because um, even for us, when we talk about um, using social media and using kind of documentary film, there are barriers to getting those um, messages and those tools to everyone, you know, and. Uh, so I would be interesting, interested in hearing, you know, other people's thoughts on that as well in terms of like, you know, uh, is, yeah, how do we make it more accessible and how do we make sure that our art does reach the people it needs to reach the most? It's a great question. I can answer from our experience, which is a lot of our programs, we work to make sure that um, we're implementing them with local organizations and in community settings. So um, we have our men care, our fatherhood posters up in health clinics, um, or we run our campaigns through schools. So I think it's really important to use the institutions that are available and the places that people are gathering um, to get the messages out and to get the the art out um, and I think to rely on those community-based strategies to really push push forward. I would just also add that I think collaboration and partnership is like one of the key ways for all organizations and and individuals who are using art or any other form to, to break barriers and, and use activism. And so I would say that even an example of like a Google Hangout like this, where it's a bunch of different individuals and organizations coming together toward a particular topic or cause to bring awareness, you go from bringing your small network as an audience to um, widening to an array of different networks, which will not only um, make the conversation more rich, but it also sort of expands people to um, audiences to opening up to learning about new things, new initiatives, new organizations, and new individuals who are doing things that they may be interested in. So I think um, across the board, collaboration and partnership is always a way to sort of break down barriers and make these types of messages more accessible to larger populations. Well, we can move on to the next question. Um, we don't all have to answer every single question. It depends on however, if the spirit moves you. Um, our next question was about, so we have someone who wants to know a little bit more about why is it that we idealize this kind of macho, violent, womanizing um, image of what men are supposed to be um, if that's not really representative of what men are these days, or really ever, if men, not all men are like that, right? Why do we think they are? Um, yeah, I, I mean that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think that uh, I think the media plays a huge role here, um, and and the larger culture as well. But um, you know, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier when we talk about gender norms and gender binary. We've been fed, you know, from birth that what makes a, um, a boy. Or man valuable are these things like um, strength, aggression, dominance, you know, and, and, I, and I think that um, by the same token, what we're taught that what's valuable about women um, and girls is their youth, beauty, sexuality, you know, or their um, uh, submissiveness, you know, versus the dominance of men. So I think that there's, you know, when kids these days, we, we recently 
were looking at a, a study that said, like, you know, teenagers consume like 10 or 11 hours of media a day in America, you know, and, and when those media messages are so filled with these stereotypes, um, we reaffirm them, we reinforce them in, in, our, in our heads, and then those people grow up to make the ads, they grow up to make the, the movies, and so I think it's like this, you know, vicious cycle of, of um, stereotyping, and then, and really the only way we can break it down, I mean, is through counter messaging and and through things like this and through art and, uh, but I but I think it's it's part of how we're we're um, you know conditioned in our culture to think about gender. We, we think about it in these two in this binary, and then we think about those two things being um, very limited. You know, so I think uh, yeah, I think that's why we we then idealize the the people who fit the extremes rather than those of us who are the majority of us who are somewhere in the middle. Right. And I think that's partially what, I mean, that's exactly what we meant with the hashtag beyond the binary is that, you know, and it's not just gender, but then in many ways we, our society tends to split things into sort of really clear cut boxes and that not all of us exist in just one box, you know what I mean? So we're thinking beyond the gender binary and, and really trying to make space for people to do that. Unless anyone else has a really pressing answer to that question. Yeah, go ahead. Well, um, Imran, Imran did uh, mention two things that I think that are uh, very important, very interesting sort of um, topics to, to jump off on. And um, one was uh, stereotypes as an archetype, and also um, people but these these archetypes, um, I guess, also controlling the discourse, and uh, I I definitely think that um, there is this ongoing cycle of um, the people who create the discourse, um, continue to discourse, or are, are at the head of discourse, are people who do fulfill these sort of roles that we feel um, uh, are key to moving society forward. You know, and which is which is not necessarily true, of course. But um, I definitely think that that is, you know, one reason why um, that these types are glorified because um, from day one that they are they are um, what for many people are exposed to or or view as um, you know these archetypes of of the public you know or the public persona. So right, yeah. The next question that we have um, focuses a little bit on just looking at how we can foster these conversations and these ideas that are pushing boundaries um, among young boys. So, you know, how how can we raise our boys to be sensitive men, to be kind men, um, to be, you know, comfortable outside of the binary? Um, one solution that we really have found through the mask you live in is um, mentorship and positive social emotional development initiatives. Um, so we have seen across various communities groups led by men from within those communities um, that are basically a safe space for young boys and their mentors or their group leaders to really just explore and talk about their social emotional development, their day-to-day -day sort of feelings in a really safe um, environment where they can be vulnerable and be their authentic selves. Um, and these obviously can take shape in many different ways depending on the community um, and the setting, whether it's in a school setting or an after-school setting or a church group or what have you but at the end of the day I think that I've seen across cultures and demographics through the research and the filming of the mask you live in that these models really do exist across our cultures on a very sort of small scale um, level and I would love to see these types of initiatives taken to a much larger level where that's sort of like normative and what we expect for our young people's development and I do think this is true for young women as well but it's also more it's more accepted that young women have these types of um, discourse and groups and and really sort of explore their feelings and their emotions and their authentic selves with one another it's way less accepted for men obviously as we've talked about today so it's been inspiring throughout 
um, the production of the mask you live in to see how much of this really is happening on the ground. Um, and I think that the more that we encourage that and bring those types of models into the mainstream, the healthier our young people and especially our young boys um, will be. I, I also think it's, um, just going off of what Danny said, I think it's really interesting to think about models where we use those those uh, areas of society which have been deemed traditionally masculine to subvert the hyper-masculinity narrative. So, for instance, we've come across programs um, like uh, Coaches for America, you know, where you have, like, sports and you have... Um, particularly certain sports which have been kind of uh, socialized to be for men or for boys and to be really about manliness like football or, or things like that. And then when you have a coach coming into that environment um, with young boys and um, teaching them that being a man is not necessarily about those things which we've typically associated with it and that it, you know, if you can get a football team to talk about love and to talk about um, you know, um, caring and, and, and protecting each other and, and being nice to each other. I mean, those are, that's one way I think you can really powerfully subvert the, um, the, 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 um, the norm. But I also think, you know, what this question really gets at, which is great, is that, you know, how can young boys actually lead this movement? You know, because young boys, you know, they're not yet hopefully, you know, they're not yet completely socialized, you know, they're not completely, you know, brainwashed yet, and, and there's so many young guys and boys who get this, you know, who understand that, you know, masculinity is not the way that they're being sold, and I would love, you know, and one of our goals in, in our campaign work around this coming film will be to try to get those young boys to be the leaders here, to tell us, you know, how they define themselves as boys, because we see it you know, more and more with uh, empowering young girls and, and giving them a voice and, and them becoming the most powerful kind of um, advocates for breaking down the binary. And I, I think there are boys out there just who want to do the same thing, you know, and I would love to find them. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to see that too. I think, I think that is a good segue into um, the, the last question that I'm going to pose that is asking about how, what are the best ways in a social situation that we can call out double standards. So that really speaks to this idea that like socialization is something that we do, right? You know, we, not all of us can control mainstream media, but we can socialize people on a day-to-day -day by, by leading by example um, and by, you know, calling out things that we see that are wrong. So, you know, how could we do that for young boys? How can we raise our young boys differently and how can we, you know, I mean, Danny, you talked about how you were policed into your gender, even as an adult. So how can we do that among our peers? I would say um, that's really challenging, um, as I kind of explained in my own personal experience. But I think that... Um, really finding a safe space to sort of discuss these types of things is the first step because I think these are all issues that are really hard for individuals to confront and face is how do I come up against peer pressure? How do I come up against the way that society wants me to be? That's obviously a really challenging thing for young boys and men in particular. And um, going back to the idea of these sort of like safe spaces for people to communicate with each other, the more that you can hash out your ideas and your feelings about something with people who you know respect and trust your opinion the more you can bring that out into the public and sort of stand up for yourself in a situation where you feel like there's a double standard being placed upon you so I, I do like to bring it back to mentorship and social emotional development and finding communities where you feel the most safe to really be your authentic self because the more I think confident young people and young boys and men and young women feel to really um, advocate for themselves, the more they will do so in their day-to-day -day life. Right. 
Um, I think um, to follow what Danny said, I completely um, agree with the creation of safe spaces. Uh, myself and some of my colleagues were recently at a at a middle school in New York, and um, we actually we showed the trailer for The Mask You Live In, and um, we showed one of our films, and we had this discussion. It was an all boys school um, about their reactions, and they were so the reactions were so beautiful and so unguarded and just great and we had them actually at one point stand up at a microphone and ask them what do you care about um, because with our uh, men care we're trying to actually start programming around boys care um, around a lot of these themes and so we said what do you care about and of course um, you know they just said the greatest things you know family being a role model for their little sisters but they also said you know Legos and football and I think it's important to support um, the diversity of caring and it can be playful and it doesn't have to be so serious but um, taking things and using you know, you care about being a role model for your sister. Well, what kind of world do you want your little sister to be in? And and using these kind of relationships and having these discussions in places where, you know, boys are being supportive of one another and supportive of their female peers. And, you know, when the event ended, we had some discussion of, like, these are extraordinary boys. But it's like, no, they're really ordinary boys, but they're in this beautiful, supportive environment. And I think that's what we really need to strive to create. Yeah, and I'll just... Uh, add also another, I feel like, great way, just everyday way of um, calling out double standards is to use humor um, and to use uh, questions. I saw recently this week, you know, uh, Emma Stone was um, on a panel with her um, co-star and boyfriend, uh, Andrew Garfield, in the Spider-Man 2, and he was talking about, uh, I think a kid asked him a question about how Spider-Man created his um, uniform, and Andrew Garfield begins by saying, you know, he sewed it, um, which is a very feminine thing to do, and then he tried to say, you know, but Spider-Man's really manly. And uh, uh, Emma Stone simply, all she actually said was, she asked a question, she said, feminine how? You know, in, in terms of, uh, and, and it was funny, you know, people laughed, but then Andrew Gar Garfield was forced to think about it, and he actually came up with a, a little bit better answer where saying, you know, that femininity exists in all of us and that, you know, that's what he meant. But, but the point is, in, in that situation, I think, you know, humor and there's kind of like sh the lighthearted questions. If, you know, I find that if you're watching a movie or with your friends or you're watching TV and somebody says something that's a little off or um, is, uh, is trying to limit people based on gender, it's really sometimes easy to just be like, well, that was weird, you know, or like, uh, what did they mean by that? You know, and I think that, uh, yeah, I just think humor, and, um, especially in our everyday lives, we don't always, we're not always in a position where we can really confront people and get really like intense, but we can always maybe just use um, light questions and humor in that way to get people to think differently. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, especially the questions, because it forces someone to think about it and whether or not they answer it, at least in thinking as opposed to being defensive, you know? So I think that I'm going to kind of round up the Hangout. Lastly, before we all um, close off, I would really love to hear what kind of projects everyone else has coming up, sort of like what, are, what sort of creative work are you doing in the next few months, you know, to the end of the year? I can go first. I'll go first about um, so here at the International Museum of Women, we recently launched our call for submissions for our next upcoming online exhibition, which is called Imagining Equality, Your Voices on Women's Human Rights. Um, and it's a crowdsourced exhibition, so anyone can submit work from any medium. And we've so far gotten so many incredible submissions, I'm overwhelmed. Um, we're really excited to take a look at them. And our call for submissions ends uh, April 30th. And then after that, we'll be reviewing and we'll be launching the exhibition um, in the next few months. So everyone keep an eye out. There's some really great stuff coming out. That sounds really exciting. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I already spoke about the mask you live in a lot, and I'll just say that we are um, we are hoping that it will premiere by the end of this calendar year, and we're very excited to be wrapping it up. And also, as an organization, we're working on a lot of what we talked about today, which is um, how to get young people and people who are passionate about the work that we're doing and um, this particular initiative um, involved in our work to speak out and represent um, our organization in the film and so we're working on some of those initiatives and we're very excited about that too. Great. 
Yeah, and I'll just say uh, that if if someone were is very much interested in this topic, particularly the film The Mask You Live, and I would just encourage them to check out our Facebook page, you know, because we do want to create uh, a hub where folks can talk about um, topic consistently and connect with each other. And if you want to be one of those young people who uh, leads this movement, I would love to hear from you as well. So, uh, because yeah, we're always looking for those folks out there. Well, um, I don't know about anything new per se, but I'm continuing to uh, do the work in the same vein that I have been doing uh, here within my own community. I'm moving to New Haven soon, and um, because I'm going to get my MFA um, there up at Yale University, so um, I'm going to be doing a lot of work there also, um, and just really immersing myself in in uh, the community that I'm that I'm in. So, wow! Congratulations. Thanks, and, uh, John. What's your um, what's the website for your um, your work that we're sure. Um, if you would like to view my work, you could go to www.johnedmondsphoto. Um, it's first name, last name, photo. J o h n e d m o n d s photo. dot com. Great. And so for us, I mentioned a few things throughout um, talking, but we will be trying to get our, our Boys Care campaign moving, which will include gathering stories of boys and creating some media and messages, really much along the lines of uh, what we were talking about today. Um, and also we have a PBS documentary on To the Contrary uh, that is launching around Father's Day, and so it details kind of what's going on in Brazil now, as well as some of the programming that Permundo's done in Brazil working with men to be more caring fathers. Uh, so you can stay tuned for that, and that should launch um, in early June. Wow, that's so exciting. I can't wait to see that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank everyone so much for being on the panel. Um, I think we had a really fascinating conversation, and I'm really excited to take a look at Twitter and see what people have had to say. Um, for those who are watching either live or who are going to be watching later on, um, I encourage you to hop onto social media and let us know what you think. Um, send us any questions uh, using the hashtag Beyond the Binary. Um, what's great about these conversations is that they continue a long time afterwards. So let's keep it going. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.